Is the housing market about to crash? Is a question a lot of disingenuous real estate YouTubers are rhetorically asking their audiences while shilling online courses and stock trading apps. I'm here to tell you that the housing market is not about to crash, and I'm going to show you all of the research that led me to this conclusion, as well as the one piece of data I found that shows where we might actually see a crash in the next few years. You don't want to miss that. I'm John Schwartz, a realtor and real estate investor in Los Angeles, California, but this video is not specific to the LA market. Today we'll look at national trends and diagnose what's going on at the national level. In fact, having pulled some very basic data for this video, I'm shocked that more real estate folks aren't talking about these trends. So what's going on here? Well, the common narrative is that the pandemic has turned the housing market upside down. Suburb seeking buyers are booming and germ wary sellers are staying on the sideline, creating a huge imbalance in supply and demand. In short, too many buyers, not enough sellers, so prices are going through the roof. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the median home price in America has grown from $280,000 to over $363,000. But that narrative isn't quite right. The pandemic didn't upend the housing market, just as it didn't upend the movie theater business or the retail sector. Watching movies at home has been a growing trend for years, and Hollywood, where I live, has been fretting over the shortening theater window. That's how long movies are exclusively in theaters before they're available for digital download or streaming. Hollywood's been fretting over the shortening theater window for a decade. So it was really only a matter of time before studios started to release movies in theaters and online simultaneously. The pandemic just shortened the timeline. And do we even need to talk about retail? Online sales jumped 44% in 2020, representing 21.3% of all retail sales, up from 15.8% in 2019. That growth, while staggering, was inevitable. The pandemic just shortened the timeline. So this supply and demand imbalance in the US housing market, it's not an aberration. It's just hit us sooner than we expected. And speaking of hitting, please do me a huge favor and hit that like button if you learned something new. Now back to the data. This graph shows the total inventory of homes for sale in the US from 2015 through the end of 2019. This is fully pre-pandemic. Now, inventory cycles annually, with peak inventory in the summer months and low inventory in the winter. But if we add the trend line, we'll see it's decidedly down. On average, between 2015 and 2019, the US housing market had about 135,000 fewer homes on the market than the same time the previous year. Now let's look at demand. This graph shows completed US home sales per month from 2015 through the end of 2019. If we graph the trend line, we can see it's on the rise. On average, each month sees about 4,400 additional homes sold than the same month the previous year. So entering the pandemic, we had an annual trend of 135,000 fewer homes on the market, but 4,400 additional sales. One can't help but ask, why? Why are fewer homes being offered for sale while more homes are being bought? Well, firstly, more Americans have been entering the home buying stage of life. According to the National Association of Realtors, the median age for a first-time homebuyer is 33. Now check out this population breakdown by age, published this year by the U.S. Census Bureau, which estimates there are currently 4,497,033 year olds in America. What else do you notice about this graph? Do you notice the steady increase in population as you move younger, from about 44 years old to 29 years old? Now, if you're 44 years old today, that means you were 33 years old 11 years ago. And if you're 29 years old today, it means you'll be 33 in four more years. So what we see here is a 15 year period in which roughly speaking, each year we see more Americans hit the median age for a first time home buyer. Demand for homes has been growing because the pool of new buyers has been growing for the last decade and will continue to grow for at least the next four years. Now what about supply? Well, there are two reasons supply is so low. The first is that supply is low, literally. This graph shows the number of US homes built by decade since the start of the 20th century. Whereas over 27 million homes were built in the decade preceding the Great Recession, under 6 million homes were built in the decade following the Great Recession. In fact, I was listening to an episode of NPR's Planet Money just this week, in which it was pointed out that the huge contraction in home building we saw after the Great Recession didn't just reduce housing supply, it also reduced the number of laborers who work in home construction and the number of students who are studying trades necessary for building homes. So making up for this huge deficit in home construction isn't just a question of ordering the houses we need. 
It's not just a question of scaling up the workforce. It's a question of ramping up education in home building trades so that we can then scale up the workforce so that we can then build the homes we need. According to Planet Money's guest, this problem will take a decade to fix. And secondly, what limited supply does exist isn't being put on the market because homeowners are staying in their homes longer. Today's seniors are living healthier and longer than ever before, and that means staying at home longer. My parents are 76 and 73, and they still live in the five-bedroom house that I grew up in in Washington, D.C. But anecdotal evidence is crap compared to data. And here's the data. The National Association of Realtors found that the percentage of home sellers who lived in their homes for 21 years or more before selling rose from 16% in 2013 to 20% in 2021. Put another way, for every four homeowners who spent more than two decades in their home eight years ago, there are now five homeowners spending more than two decades in their home. And remember our graph showing population by age? Here's what it looks like in the 50 to 80 year olds range. My 76 year old dad is an elder boomer and the Census Bureau estimates that there are only 2,104,000 76 year olds in America right now. Population by age increases steadily as we go younger to 58 years old at which age we have a population of 4,477,000. This makes sense given that the youngest boomers are about 55 years old right now. What this means is, for the next 20 years, a larger and larger percentage of homeowners are going to be living in their homes longer. In 20 years, there will be roughly double the number of 75 year olds who, like my dad, will still be living in their homes. So now let's talk about the pandemic, but in the context of the trends we just uncovered. This graph shows the total inventory of US homes for sale from January 2015 through June 2021. The trend line in this graph reflects the 2015 through 2019 numbers. So what we see here is that yes, the the pandemic pulled down inventory to a new low, but we're actually not far from the trend line established by the preceding five years of activity. The pandemic didn't upend inventory, it just accelerated its decline, and we should expect this trend to continue for at least the next decade, if not two. This graph shows existing home sales per month from January 2015 through June 2021, again with a trend line that reflects the 2015 through 2019 numbers. In this graph, we can barely even see the pandemic's impact. Home sales in June 2021 are higher than they've ever been, but in the context of the existing trend line, they're not much higher than we'd expect. So this is why I'm confident there won't be a crash in the housing market. Unlike in 2005 and 2006, the run-up in pricing is the result of long-standing trends merely accelerated by a global pandemic. If you look at the demographic data, home buyer and home seller characteristics, and home construction numbers over time, it's clear that these trends are going to continue for the foreseeable future. That said, there are three wild cards we need to consider, three extraordinary factors that are a result of the health pandemic. Very low interest rates, a forbearance program that will inevitably lead to foreclosures, and lastly, the huge amount of stimulus pumped into our economy this past year. We'll start with interest rates. This graph shows the average interest rate on a 30-year mortgage, and as you can see, rates hit their lowest since Freddie Mac started keeping track in 1971. Lower rates means home buyers can afford more home. At a 3.5% interest rate, a $2,000 mortgage payment covers a loan for $445,391. But at a 2.5% interest rate, that same $2,000 payment affords you a loan of $506,175. In this example, a one-point change in the interest rate creates a 13.6% change in the amount of money that can be borrowed. And the rule of thumb amongst real estate professionals is that a 1% change in interest rates creates a 10% change in pricing. This rule of thumb accounts for down payments, taxes, and insurance. Just before the pandemic, the national average interest rate on a 30-year mortgage was 3.45%. Last month, the national average hit 2.87%. This drop of 58 basis points should account for a 5.8% increase in pricing, roughly. So lower interest rates are definitely contributing to higher prices, meaning the impact of higher rates, which many people predict are coming as the economy gets back up to speed, would be downward pressure on pricing. This is true, but it's not something that I worry about. Firstly, rates can't move fast enough to create a home value crash, so that's off the table. And secondly, rates and home prices and the economy are densely intertwined metrics. Mortgage rates have been below 5% for a decade, and if they were to climb above 5% in the next few years, it would mean our economy is on fire. 
Yes, your home value would suffer, but you'd probably be making more money than ever at your job. And if you think you should wait until rates climb and prices drop before buying, the joke's on you because you won't be able to afford as much house when rates climb. That's why rates, so long as they stay relatively low, are kind of irrelevant. Next up, forbearance and foreclosures. The idea here is that a bunch of homeowners went into forbearance, meaning they stopped making mortgage payments, and will eventually be foreclosed upon when the forbearance program expires. When these foreclosures hit the market, pricing will plummet and we'll have our crash. This is stupid. The simple fact is we won't see enough foreclosures to meaningfully move the needle on pricing. Only a third of homeowners who went into the forbearance program are still in it. And only 70% of that group isn't making payments. And because home values have risen so much, only a fraction of that group won't be able to just sell their property and pay off the mortgage to avoid a foreclosure. So long story short, the wave of foreclosures that clickbaity channels like to discuss will be but a trickle released over years. Okay, finally, let's talk stimulus. The Fed has pumped about $4 trillion into the US economy, literally doubling their balance sheet in the span of a year and a half. Now look, I'm not an economist. Real economists? the kind of people whose time is too well compensated to be wasted on producing YouTube videos, they aren't in agreement as to what this much stimulus will do in the long term. Like I said, I'm not an economist, but here's a little graph I made to put everything into context. This line shows the growth of the Fed's balance sheet indexed to 100 in January 2015. The Fed was actually reducing its balance sheet through 2019, and then you can see the huge stimulus spike that starts in April 2020. For context, Here's the consumer price index over the same period, also indexed to 100 in January 2015. Indexing allows us to compare the relative growth of disparate metrics. I love indexing. Here's GDP growth over the same period, again indexed. You can see the sudden contraction in the first quarter of 2020, but it looks like we're more or less back to where we should be. All right, now let's have some fun. Here's what the US median home price looks like over this period. In the long term, since 2015, it's grown about as much as the Fed balance sheet. I'm going to repeat myself and say again that I'm not an economist, but this graph gives me the impression that the stimulus spending hasn't had as dramatic an effect on home pricing as the naysayers would have you believe. But do you want to see something that is dramatic? Here's the growth of the S&P 500 since 2015. The stock market has really been on a tear since the pandemic started. In fact, the S&P 500 has nearly doubled over the same period that the Fed's balance sheet has doubled. That's what has me worried. If anything is a bubble right now, it's the stock market. If there's any market that I worry about crashing, it's the stock market. When somebody tells me that they don't want to buy property because of pricing, but meanwhile all of their investments are in the stock market, I can't help but roll my eyes. If a crash is coming, it's inequities. For all my viewers in Los Angeles, in next week's video, I'm going to discuss how these supply and demand trends are playing out in our local market. We'll examine pricing and demographic trends in LA County, as well as discuss how things like Prop 13 and Prop 19 are changing the landscape. If you haven't already, please subscribe. See you next week.